Welcome to another episode of, of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast. And um, I'd like to hear from you because I want to know, am I pitching this right? Is it too technical? Is it too simple? Um, uh, is it giving the wrong amount of weight to research and not enough weight to basic studies? Would you like to do some teaching? Would you like to hear from me about how to improve some of your basic skills, like um, spec reconstruction, for example? Or would you like to hear about what the latest and greatest in what's happening in meetings around the world? Whatever it happens to be, just let me know and I'll see what I can do. Um, obviously, this is an amateur podcast where I don't have any um, professional input um, in terms of funding and I have to find my own way to get to meetings and, and record these podcasts, but I'll do my best and um, I'm sure you'll find this of interest. So please, get in touch with me, let me know what you think, um, rob at nukecast.com, rob at n-u-c-c-a-s-t dot com. And don't forget to go to the website nukecast.com um, and you can subscribe to further episodes by just putting in your email address or if you're particularly interested in just the cardiac segment, it's cardiac.nukecast.com. Either way, let me know and, uh, and I'll get back to you and uh, maybe we can uh, work out a, some new episodes. Maybe we can work out ways of doing this teaching and maybe you can help me out. Perhaps you want to do a quiz based on the podcast for your local society to provide CPD points. Whatever it is, let's work together and let's see if we can uh, get more information out there. Meanwhile, why don't we get on to the next episode of the podcast? We're here again at the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency meeting um, and in Vienna, and I'm very privileged uh, to be speaking to uh, George Siegel from the Society of Nuclear Medicine uh, in America. And uh, uh, this meeting um, has been concentrating on PET and uh, molecular I imaging, and I'd just like to... Um, while I've got the opportunity to, to, to grab George and ask him a little bit, a bit about where the future of, uh, of PET imaging in particular lies, particularly as we've got at this meeting lots of people from middle level countries that are, are rapidly developing PET um, and their income is increasing and we've got the United States where the income might be heading in the other direction so perhaps there's a bit of a joining in the middle in terms of in terms of uh, what might be happening. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to start by, um, uh, by um, uh, uh, asking uh, Dr Siegel um, what uh, about uh, standardization of therapy um, in particular how that saves money and how we can argue for PET in facilities that uh, uh, that can do standardization so I think PET is definitely cost effective right and I think PET is definitely underutilized because right. our own data shows that only six percent of patients with uh, cancer who undergo CT for evaluation also get PET CT and we feel that that figure should be closer to 20 or 30 percent. So why isn't PET being utilized more frequently? I think there is a paucity of data on cost effectiveness and insurers, the government, is still not convinced that PET CT is cost effective. Part of that is based on lack of evidence, and the reason for lack of evidence is, a, is that there aren't standard criteria for response evaluation. So if you're looking at SUV changes, no one can tell you for certain whether a change of greater than 30% indicates a change in disease status, or whether SUV needs to change 50% or somewhere in between. So standardization of response evaluation criteria are going to be very important uh, for the adoption of PET as a routine test for evaluating uh, response to therapy. Right, because the justification for an expensive PET test is that you're going to save yourself money by, um, by not doing um, an expensive um, intervention like surgery or like chemotherapy, which isn't going to help, 
or that you don't need to do anymore because it's already fixed. Um, so th that's the kind of um, justification you can use and in order to do that you need to have a standard way to measure that. Um, so there's standard phantoms and standard um, areas to go. So internationally what's happening in terms of that, in terms of what people can do, in terms of making their pet centre standard uh, to other pet centres? I think what I've learned in coming to this conference at the IAEA it was a bit of a surprise that people look to U.S. standards uh, for uh, developing guidelines in their own countries. Uh, many of them uh, are aware of, if don't in fact use, the guidelines of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Uh, so I think uh, those guidelines that we do have in the U.S. are pretty uh, well developed and that's good for the international community. But I think it's also essential that we develop global standards for response evaluation. And when I was answering the first question about response evaluation, I wasn't so much thinking about the ability of PET to detect metastatic disease and avoid feudal surgery. I was talking more about standardizing response criteria in the patients who are getting systemic treatment like chemotherapy. Then it's less clear of the role of PET. In, in the case of uh, to go forth with surgery or avoid surgery, I think it's very clear. You don't need refined criteria, you just need certainty that something that's PET positive is due to malignancy. But when you're dealing with chemotherapy, particularly when you're evaluating chemotherapy in mid-course, then it's not as clear because PET is often not positive or negative, it's a matter of percent Reduced. change. Oh, and okay. there we don't have standardized criteria to indicate that chemotherapy is really working. And there, in the absence of criteria, is an opportunity for global cooperation in defining those criteria. And uh, people are already getting together and the SNM is talking with the EANM to, um, uh, to devise uh, standardized criteria for pet response. The SNM and the EANM are not the only organizations. I, I know that the consortium that came up with RESIST is looking at uh, going from RESIST 1.1 to RESIST 2.0. That would include um, PET CT characteristics as part of standardized criteria. So I think everybody recognizes there is a great need for that and a lot of groups are working on it. We all know about FTG for, for PET, but the other areas, as with nuclear medicine in general, we've got to look at new traces. Now, quite a few of the, there's a, quite a lot of new traces around, but which ones are really going to make it and which ones really do we need to concentrate on? Because it's expensive to try and have a, a wide variety of traces at any site. Um, what, what new traces do you think... Um, do you think we're liable to really need and really use? Um, um, I saw some good stuff here with FLT, for example, particularly in places where you have high infection rates, uh, to, to, to use that to distinguish lymphoma from, um, uh, from, uh, uh, from infection. Um, uh, perhaps also um, f miso to look for hypoxia when you're trying to do radiotherapy evaluation and um, the uh, amyloid traces. Um, do you think they're the ones to go for or do you think, should, or do you think there's others that perhaps uh, we should be looking at in terms of planning our future? In, in terms of planning our future, I think it's abundantly clear that uh, everybody needs to learn about imaging amyloid plaque. Uh, there are three agents, all backed by large commercial companies, uh, that have completed phase three clinical trials in the United States. Uh, all are very close to getting final approval. And uh, approval of the first agent is expected uh, in early 2012. Uh, since the estimates of the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in patients reaching their ninth decade are anywhere from 30 to 50 percent, this is a big public health uh, issue. Also, dementias are the fourth leading cause of death in high-income countries. So because of the high prevalence of disease and because the beta amyloid imaging agents are very close to approval, I think in the very near future uh, people should uh, learn more about these agents. 
The other thing is, of course, we've now got treatments that can slow down. These treatments are expensive. Um, so uh, it makes it's cost effective to be able to diagnose these diseases early to know whether it's useful to, to give the treatment or not. So that's again an area where it can be argued from a government point of view that you need to be doing uh, PET where it's cost effective and the, these amyloid agents seem to be the way to do that. Yes, and there's one other point. Uh, some people argue that if you suspect Alzheimer's disease in a patient with mild cognitive impairment, that you should go ahead and just start anticholinesterase therapy because it's safe. Uh, but I want to point out that anticholinesterase therapy in patients who have uh, dementia with Lewy bodies actually do poorly on anticholinesterase inhibitors, and in fact, there are reports of rare fatal reactions. So characterization of dementia type is difficult based solely on clinical grounds alone. And uh, if you have a patient with uh, dementia, but you're uncertain whether it's Alzheimer's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies, then I think it would be very helpful to have uh, a beta amyloid scan in those patients. I think perhaps the other point to make with beta amyloid is that we've already had you know, PET imaging for, for uh, dementias. We've had that for a very long time. And we've had other types of imaging for dementias. But the, the beta amyloid seems to take a lot of the fuzziness out. Would that be a fair comment? Well, uh, for those people who've actually seen the beta amyloid scans, uh, uh, there is still a lot of fuzziness uh, because it's very difficult um, in about 20% of the cases to determine whether beta amyloid is actually present and what you're looking at. So if it's a negative scan, it's easy. If it's fl floridly positive, it's easy. But as we all know, there are many cases that fall in between. And this was the FDA's concern in the United States, which is why it did not grant uh, approval to the first agent, Florbetapir, um, when it came up for NCD consideration. And their reservation was that there was no broad-based educational initiative to ensure that physicians would know how to interpret amyloid scans correctly. And the SNM is one of the organizations working to address that educational gap. It seems like that seems to be the answer here, and that's one of the goals of the IEA, education, education, and education in every area, not just for physicians, but for technologists also. I think particularly when you're dealing with, um, uh, dealing with dementia, and we also had some pet on children today, I think those are particular areas which are particularly challenging to get acquire good images, because I think garbage in is garbage out. And how important do you think it is to get good technologist and, and reconstruction uh, training and all those sorts of areas to make sure that you get good images? Does, how, how important is that um, to, to reporting an image to have a good one to start with? Well, it's fundamental. You, you have to have good imaging. But uh, I must say, uh, the profession of nuclear medicine technology is a highly evolved profession with very high uh, performance standards. And in terms of amyloid imaging, I don't think the potential problems are in poor fuzzy images. The images are very good quality. It's just that uh, a certain percentage of those images are on the cusp in terms of the volume of amyloid that they actually detect. So it's not that the images are funny, it's just that uh, we're uncertain where the threshold should be in reading a study in a binary fashion as amyloid absent or amyloid present. Okay, but I mean the the other alternatives, um, the MRIs, the um, the other uh, imaging has got a, a much bigger area in the middle that's uncertain in terms of that. And particularly, you, you you may think the patient's got dementia, but you're not really sure what kind. Would that be a fair comment? I think that's a very accurate assessment of the current situation. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I know we've got another session to get on with, and I appreciate your time and uh, and thank you very much for talking to us. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for asking. Thanks for listening to the episode. I'm, I'm sure you found it as interesting as I did. Um, tell me a bit about what you'd like to see. Is it PET CT like I've got here? Great scanner, time of flight, uh, 128, and new developments, perhaps more on PET MRI. Uh, perhaps more on some basic applications of nuclear medicine that you can apply in SPECT or, or in your home practice. 
perhaps more on therapy, perhaps more on uh, how we can cooperate together to um, uh, reduce efficiency, perhaps more looking at costs. Wherever it is, let me know and I'll see what I can do about getting an episode that's going to be of interest to you. So uh, let me know. Uh, that's rob at nukecast.com.